the number one thing that I look for to know if that, that is an all-star leader is do they try to develop other leaders? So you, I mean, you have to be a leader to develop other leaders, but if you are constantly investing in your people, trying to make them get better rather than focusing on the product or the service, then I think that differentiates good business owners from great business owners. Welcome to the Grant Owen Podcast, where we explore the world of entrepreneurship. Join us as we dive into the nitty gritty of what it takes to start, grow, and scale a successful business. We're on a mission to share our experiences, failures, insights, and advice with others. Whether you're just starting out in your entrepreneurial journey, or you're looking to take your business to the next level, tune in and join the conversation about what it takes to succeed in the world of business. We going for Welcome to the podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, today I have Yusuf with me and he is a friend, a colleague in a mastermind and I'm so excited to delve into his knowledge of what it takes to outsource yourself and get out of the daily grind. Um, before we dive into the conversation, um, I make these podcasts for one person. There's one person that's listening to this that needs to hear about how to outsource and how to actually delegate and how to get themselves out of their business and how to, how to think bigger so that they can actually move to the things that are more important and actually focus on balance in life. There's one person that's listening to this that can get value from it, and I make it for you. So if you're listening to this and you, you benefit from it, think about another person that you think would also benefit from this conversation and just send it to them. I don't need ratings. I don't need reviews. I don't need comments. I don't need likes or shares. Just one person, send it to them so that they can get value too because that's what we make it for. So Yusuf, thank you so much for being with me. Um, thanks for spending time on this podcast and, and for just giving your time and your value to this community. Thank you so much for having me, Grant. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about your background and experience before we dive into the the what's probably more applicable to business owners uh, and what will probably be super helpful from your insight. Tell me about how you've gained authority in this. So so you started in retail, right? Yeah, I've been in retail all of my life. Always loved dealing with customers, uh, and and really loved working in small businesses. I mean, I, I've worked at. Uh, bigger retailers, you know, like uh, Best Buy, the Future Shops of the World, um, yeah. always as a salesperson. And uh, small businesses, though, really have a special place in my heart because um, they are usually run by people who are very entrepreneurial and trying to make a dream happen. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the space that I live in today. What do you? Uh, I want to. I want to dive into that because what do you think is the difference between a small business owner and a med- medium size? Like, what's the there's a lot of bottlenecks I'm sure we could talk about, but like, what have you, have you found a consistent theme where it's like someone who is a small business owner should just stay a small business owner? That, that's like, that's the skill that they're, they really are going to thrive in long term. Um, everybody has different motivations. Um, so people who run small businesses tend to do it for one of many reasons. Uh, sometimes it's just to put food on the table, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Growing up uh, here in Ottawa, uh, in Canada, I, uh, my dad was kind of my role model when it came to small business. He was very entrepreneurial. We had a couple of hair salons uh, growing up. He's a very artistic kind of guy, but he was basically good at anything. So he could, you know, uh, he was a carpenter back in Egypt when, uh, wow. you know, before I was born. Uh, and always kind of did his own thing. He didn't really like yeah. having a, a, a boss per se. Um, yeah. So uh, having a small business could be as simple as just making sure to support your family, which is very honorable, uh, or opening up a business so that you can solve a very specific problem for a very specific kind of customer. And really the difference between your medium business and the small business is, you know, size of the mar- addressable market, uh, how easily you can scale and, you know, the demand for your product. Do you think that some like, do you recommend more people stay small business? Do you recommend, or, or, or I'm guessing when people work with you, especially it's not even just how to get out of your small business yourself, but it's like potentially how you could franchise, how you could scale, how, how you could take the same models and apply it to different markets or different niches like which do you recommend that like the normal person should kind of go for because i'm sure it's different for everybody but a lot of people just need to stay it um i I honestly i I really believe that anyone should try to grow their business and and the reason why they don't is because they believe that if more if they get more business they're going to have more chaos in their life and that's a lot of the reasons why people 
uh, that have small business, you know, tend to keep it as a small business because they just don't want to work longer hours. So I believe if that, you know, limiting belief wasn't there, then more people would grow their businesses than what we have today. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so so tell me about uh, how how did you transition from from retail to this consulting that you do now? Um, so uh, if we were, I've been in retail all my life, like I said before, but specifically, I was in the telecommunications industry. I sold cell phones and cell phone plans uh, all throughout university, so I was very kind of familiar with with that industry, um, yeah. and I was pretty good at it. Um, and, um, uh, my most recent job was the thing that kind of made me realize that I wanted to help other business owners scale their business. Um, at the time it was about 2015 and, uh, smartphone repair in Canada, um, was, um, kind of a very difficult service to deal with as a customer. The only options yeah. for your average person was either go to the accessory kiosk in the mall to get your screen fixed. That guy may not be there a year later or go to your carrier where you bought your phone and have them send it out. Maybe they give you a loaner, maybe they don't. And you have to like wait two weeks and then like, you know, all your baby photos are, are gone. Like your phone's completely wiped. It was just a horrible yeah. experience, right? Um, and one of the people that originally hired me approached me about reinventing or kind of disrupting that industry uh, and kind of unifying a scattered market and creating a cell phone repair business model where you could go to a very professional place and get your phone fixed the same day. Okay. Sometimes within even yeah. 60 minutes. Uh, yeah. I thought that it, I thought it was a very interesting idea. And uh, five yes. months later, I signed my contract uh, to a company called mobile clinic as employee number one. So uh, okay. they sent me to Europe uh, to learn uh, a, lot, a little bit about that business from uh, another company who had the same concept. I took two technicians with me. And when we got back, we opened our first location in Ottawa. And I was there for really? about six years. Yeah, we uh, was there for about okay. six years. Uh, I was responsible for... At one location? No. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, okay. Our, okay. that first location, I was responsible for like finding parts, finding suppliers, uh, getting the uniform, uh, putting together our POS system or like our repair yeah. management system, uh, making sure that we had accessories on the wall, um, you know, training the yeah. staff on how to repair phones and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I really got things going and we opened in September of 2015 and we started to see a lot of great traction. Uh, most people here in Canada, they buy their cell phones from a mall not usually from like a strip mall or a, a, somewhere that's like outside. So we didn't really spend a lot of money ad on advertising because the foot traffic was getting the exposure that we wanted. And in the six years that I was at Mobile Clinic, uh, I helped them open over 90 locations across the country. So Dang. it was a very, I don't know if it's the longest or the shortest six years of my life because <laughs> it was very, very busy, but we ended up... Yeah. Um, having official partnerships with Samsung, which is the largest smartphone manufacturer in the world, uh, with Apple, yeah. with Google, with Huawei, with LG. Um, and uh, at, in 2020, uh, TELUS, which is one of the major carriers here in Canada, bought Mobile Clinic for 165 yeah. million. And like, I was like awesome. on top of the world, right? Um, but this was like right during, like right in the height of COVID. It was June 2020 when the sale went through. Um, so everybody was working from home at that time. Um, I was like never busier in my career. I had paid off all of my debt with the shares that I had. Uh, you know, secure a job. Like life was life was good. You know, but literally everybody else around me who had a small business was suffering. They were just trying to tread water, uh, and you know. Yeah. Running a business is hard already, uh, but with all of the restrictions and the lockdowns that we had here, um, there was like the goalpost was always moving, you know, so it just made things really, really difficult. I know people who have closed their businesses permanently and I honestly, I just like it didn't sit right with me, you know, to feel like really good when people like 
like my own dad, for example, he had to shut down his businesses permanently. And I just didn't, I just, I couldn't live with myself, you know, to be in the corporate world uh, and keep doing this. And while, while knowing that small businesses and local businesses are so important and central to the economy, um, you know that, you know that yeah. maybe you have a place like this for yourself, but you may have, you go to a place that's like a really good sandwich shop that you just visit frequently or a, a nice coffee place. Like, yep. you, like your life wouldn't be the same without places like that. You know, sometimes I go to, uh, we just came back from Greece with uh, my wife um, and there was all these like little places that I'm like, I wish we had places like this back home, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah. from, from that yeah. day, I decided that I was going to use my talents to help small businesses scale, at least have a fighting chance when, you know, things like that happen and to, to help uh, other business owners, you know, solve real world problems or, you know, market their product or their service to, to help the economy, to help society. Um, so that's essentially in a nutshell why I do what I do. I love that. I love that. Well, so tell me about, tell me about your first client. What was that? What was taking on that on? Like, what did you, cause in that, in that sense, you're thinking about, I need to help. I need to save people from these negative things and shutting down their business. Like, how do you go about offering your services mm -hmm. and being like, Hey, just, so you know, like it's an investment to work with me. It's yeah. an investment to, to help me help you. Um, but here's the value proposition. If you don't do this, you might lose everything. Like, how did you, how did you go about that for your first client and then scale? So I used warm outreach and people within my own network. I reached out to people that I knew, uh, who had businesses. And, um, when I first started at mobile clinic, everybody thought I was like pretty crazy leaving like a stable job to go into this like startup high risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when the company sold, a lot of people heard about what I did. Uh, so that gave me a lot of, uh, credibility. Um, and one of my friends, uh, wanted me to do, um, what I did for mobile clinic for, for him at a smaller scale, obviously. But, um, he said, you know, can, can you write processes for us? Can you help us with our systems, with our training, with our hiring? And I was like, absolutely. So funny enough, I actually did not work on a logo or a website or a motto or anything. Uh, uh, I just was like, let's like, I just want, you just dove I just want to help people yeah. first. I'll figure out all of that stuff later, you know? So we started yeah. working together. I helped him with a, uh, really interesting, uh, cannabis retail business, uh, here in, here in <laughs> Ottawa, we opened two locations. Okay. Um, nice. and, uh, I, I now help him with, Good market to yeah, be it's, uh, I help him now with his restaurants. Uh, and another business cool. that he has as well. And, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a great, great learning experience. Um, which is pretty, yeah, I can't really say better things than that. I, I have learned so much in the last two years consulting and really starting to figure out where I have the most value, uh, and what my core, you know, like, you know, my core offering is. Love it. Love it. Well, yeah. So what, I guess that, that leads me to the question. Cause I want to talk about, I want to talk about small business owners and what you're sure. doing and, and what you've done and, and how you consult and what you recommend. But I'm curious for you, like, how do you scale? So I, I, when, when we started interacting, you told me like, you know, Grant, like I've got my clients and I want to help people, but like, I'm not like, I'm, I'm at capacity in the sense of like, I'm helping who I'm helping and they're, I want to service them right. And I'm not, I'm not needing more money. I'm not needing, like I've got my energy is devoted to the right amount of people. Um, how do you want to scale yourself? Do you want to, do you want to help more small businesses? Like how does, what is that going to look like over the 100%. next two years? So uh, right now in the middle of creating an offer that is scalable, because right now the, the number one resources that is being eaten up is my time essentially. Right. Uh, so unless yep. I can clone yep. myself, uh, it is very, very difficult to scale, uh, which is why, you know, we're in the yeah. same kind of the coaching group, uh, Dan Martel's elite coaching group and, uh, his book kind of revolutionized the way that I think about scaling because I've always been about efficiency, yeah. automation, training other people. Uh, like in my last gig, I was responsible for training and development. So I trained the entire store team, like 400 technicians or something like that. Anytime a new phone came out 
or anytime yeah. like we needed to launch a store, we had to train these people and we had to find effective ways of making sure that they had all of the tools and the training to be able to deal with the customer. Um, yeah. And it was really all about saving time, right? So when I reached out to Dan uh, on LinkedIn, I was like, you know, I, I just want to maybe work on something with him or have him mentor me or something like that. To my surprise, he replied. Uh, and then one thing led to another and we're in this, you know, coaching group. But time is the biggest thing that I help people with first because that is the number one thing that they need to get back before they can start, you know, um, hiring new people or training people, new people, you have to have time to do those things. Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. generally speaking for me, if I wanted to scale, I will look at tools first and then people second. So I use AI in a lot of pieces of my business, um, from transcribing my meetings to chat GPT to, you know, you name it. Um, but only now am I starting to look for an executive assistant who will help me with all of the administrative tasks. I will be able to teach that person how I specifically do things, like what my methods are. Um, and yeah. then it's yeah. it's marketing. Like that's what I work on next is how do I get more clients with the time that I get back? Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk then. Awesome. We'll talk then. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, my question to you then is like, what is, uh, I imagine a lot of small business owners so like we take it, if we take your ICP, like your ideal client profile, a lot of small business owners, they're doing stuff themselves, they're feeling overwhelmed financially, and then feeling like they have to compensate with their energy and their time. And you're saying time's the first thing they get back. Um, how, how, do you, how do you toss a lifeline when they feel like they're kind of already underwater? How do you toss that like, because I, I can imagine that, especially after COVID, and they're thinking about, man, the looming recession, I'm thinking, of, like, and... And if it's a service-based business, it's less productized, um, and it's a specific location, it's a restaurant, it's something like that. How, like, where do you start? Where do you start in terms of thinking? Okay, this is the first win I can get you of getting your time back. This is the first win I can get you in terms of your energy going towards. Okay, there's a vision that you don't have to be drowning, and your business can su succeed without. So you. everybody's, uh, everybody has specific issues uh, when it comes to their business, but I like to take a holistic approach. And I not only talk to the business owner, but if the business owner is interested enough, I also like to talk to people who work for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I work specifically in the retail and hospitality uh, industries. Um, and generally speaking, you have staff who are selling your product or, you know, or your service. And I find that a lot of times that the business owner is having issues with his people uh, and that's why they end up doing everything themselves. So I like to ask more probing questions mm -hmm. to really understand like, well, why aren't your people doing their jobs correctly and where can I help you there? Um, and my specific, you know, value I think is in training and creating better brand ambassadors for that company. Um, because if they had great mm -hmm. people and they knew everything that they Oh, well, they, they knew everything. Sorry, I'll restart that sentence. They knew what to do when the owner wasn't around and the owner felt comfortable, yeah. then, then they wouldn't be spending so yeah. many hours doing all of these things, right? Yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's a bit of a balance between, you know, uh, letting go control, right? That's like a limiting thing that business owners have, regardless of how well their people uh, are doing. Uh, but also it could be a training issue. Um, the business owner is typically the person who knows how to do things um, best when it comes to their craft, but not necessarily all of the other business administration yeah. pieces. So um, yeah. I, I try to be very, very intentional about what problem we're trying to solve uh, and see if there's something that is in the business owner's blind spot that they are not seeing which is why I talk to people in the company as well and see how they can be supported. Um, I found at least from my past experience working with other clients is that uh, a brand, a company and brand reset does wonders for morale. 
So if I were to assign a client and yeah. you know they wanted to get things started, I try to use that to get as much momentum as possible. So I will recreate their company and their brand training to get everybody really, really excited. And it just kind of gets everybody in a really good yeah. mood to try to solve problems, to take initiative, uh, to show more of a sense of ownership and leadership in, in the company. And that makes the it makes everybody feel better, especially the business owner, because then they're like, oh, this is great. I've never felt anybody feel so passionate about their job before, you know, so um, yeah, that's that's yep. generally the, the yeah. approach I would take. How how often do you have to how often do you struggle to earn the trust of the team? So if you're coming in, I can imagine if maybe they've hit, made some bad hires or maybe they just there's just a, a negative connotation between them and the owner. Like there's a negative relationship already. There's negative dynamic. How often is it like it's a, an uphill battle for you to come in and be like, yep, this is another guy that s suddenly I have to pretend like he's my boss or I have to be trained on what I know how to do. And he's telling me that I have to do it a different way, even though. Yeah, I know how to do it. Like most of those times, people that are working in those positions don't love working in those positions. That's not their favorite yeah. thing to do in the world. So, like, how do you how do you how do you overcome that? Um, that's a great question uh, because it's always an uphill battle. Nobody likes to work with consultants. Nobody likes consultants. <laughs> so, I always try yeah. to take the approach of uh, a you don't report to me, so you technically don't have to do what I say. Right. I want to show you what's worked for me from my experience. I always try to tell them about, mm -hmm. you know, my track record, which helps with the credibility aspect of it. But I, I try not to focus on like the smartphone repair as, as so that people don't get too fixated on that. You know, every business needs training. Everybody, yeah. everybody needs processes. Everybody needs, you know, a predictable and scalable uh, like business model. Um, so I try to really understand what is the thing that I can help these people with the most before I try to direct them? So like I always try to connect before I direct. Hmm. Does that make sense? Um, and, and I found that that works really, really well. How often do you have to, have you ever had to like come across and just be like, Hey, I think, I just think this particular person is bringing down the culture of your whole business a lot. And you need to consider firing them or like, because sometimes yeah. it is, sometimes it's like there's a top down cultural issue. And then on another level, there's a bottom up cultural issue where it's like, maybe they just made a bad hire and maybe that teammate's just going to be, it's just going to be a tough convincing them that they should care about yeah. their role. And so like sometimes just refresh is like actually what people need. And sometimes yeah. the business owner doesn't like recognize that that's yeah that needs it's to uh it's pretty rare I, I believe people want to do well at their job i mean see most people so i have come across yeah. some situations like that but they are the exception and sometimes it's the business owner themselves that's the issue you know uh okay uh that. it means that, mean? that they want to run their business a certain way uh and and sometimes that doesn't work so they're either their management style uh, is causing too much churn, you know, and so they're having to uh, people like yeah. leave and then you have to hire another person and then that person leaves. And you have to have another person again to replace that. So trying to get the bet like a holistic view from how the company or the employees feel about the management style and how work is in general really helps me understand where to tackle. And I, I always try to figure out if I ask myself one basic question to try to figure out what I'm going to do. And I ask myself if I believe that this person can be part of the solution or are they a part of the problem? Um, and mm -hmm. when I frame it that way, I try to first, uh, and this is something that I learned from an, an old mentor of mine. Uh, I try to motivate, then negotiate, then legislate. Uh, if, if I cannot motivate them or negotiate with them, I, at that point, you'll like, this is something that you have to do because this is the direction that we're going in. And if they can't, then the business owner will have to consider, you know, parting ways with this person. Um, and if it's the bus business owner themselves, I part ways. I, I, I can't yeah. help anybody who doesn't yeah. want to help themselves, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so then. What is, uh, do you, uh, do you come across most of the time with small business owners, micromanagers? Is that the majority of what um, you, you can yeah, come across? Yeah, it's pretty common. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause like, I guess 
either they don't care or they care so much that they create negative processes and then they try to push the negative processes that lead to a demotivated group where the owner doesn't trust them to be brand ambassadors and they don't feel trust to do what they feel like they're able to do and actually bring their skill set involved. I can imagine that's like a, a consistent theme. It happens a lot in corporate mm-hmm. environments too. It's not exclusive to small business. Um, what, what would you say classifies like a, just an all-star uh, owner or leader? Like what, what, what's a trait that you're like, okay, if, if, if they have this quality, I know that, that we can get the results that we were, we're trying to get. The, the, the number one thing that I look for to, to know if that, if that is an all-star leader is do they try to develop other leaders? Uh, so you, I mean, you have to be a leader to develop other leaders, but if you are constantly investing in your people and trying them to, trying to make them get better rather than focusing on the product or the service, uh, then I think that differentiates like good business owners from great business owners. Uh, because at some point, like there's only so much you can do with your menu at a restaurant, right? But you can develop the chef, right? And the chef is responsible for developing the menu. So if you develop those people who are expected to take ownership for their pieces of the business, I find those types of people tend to do much better. Their companies do better. Their employees are happier. They make more sales, uh, less turnover. I mean, the end, like the benefits are endless. Yeah, I love that. So, so uh, yeah, talk to me. Talk to me about about leaders. We were talking before this about how how you were reading a book, um, and and there was just something referenced about how how we become our own bottlenecks. So like. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about your perspective of what you've seen from an impactful leader versus someone that, yeah. that probably... Um, I was reading a book by John C. Maxwell, and he referred to something called the law of the lid, uh, which essentially states that the leader is the lid on your organization, and the organization can never be as good uh, or can never be better than the quality mm-hmm. of their leader. And I took this to heart because I'm like, if I want my clients to level up, I also got to level up first, right? So, uh, and I see this all the time. Uh, Like you will never have an organization that is better than the people that lead that organization. Uh, And that's kind of like, that's essentially what is your lid. So it's only when the leadership improves that uh, they they bring everybody up with them and the organization benefits as a result. Love it. Okay. So, so, um, what's an easy, like, what if, what if the leader doesn't have time? What if the leader doesn't have time to level up? What if the leader doesn't have time for perspective? Cause a lot of times when we get bogged down by the details of our business, when we get bogged down by, by the people we're trying to take care of or the, the customers we're trying to service, it's hard for us to have an yeah. objective perspective and understand and have the self-awareness to be like, yep, I struggle with this and I need help with this. We try to make time by uh, essentially freeing up uh, or or eliminating tasks that they shouldn't be working on at all uh, or trying to find things that they can delegate effectively without feeling that that task isn't being done, you know, uh, to their standard. So... Uh, it's it's kind of one of the reasons why I like to develop training because when you want to train somebody, there are several different pieces that you need to um, uh, take into account. And that is, what are you training them on? You know, the process, what is the behavior? Um, are Is there any friction in the operations that is preventing people from doing what they need to do? And once you're able to free up some of those things that the... Um, a business owner is spending their own time on, then we take that time and reinvest it into developing themselves, uh, developing the overall business, you know, like working on the business rather than in it. Um, and I've seen that that works really, really well. So one of the things that I particularly do with my clients, and you can see like all these books behind me, is I'm big on reading. Even before I met Dan Martell, I read all the time. Um, I'm 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 such a big uh, fan of nonfiction books. I, I don't think I even have like 
three novels. <laughs> um, yeah, so That's I crazy. actually recommend, like I take a lot of my material from these books and I put it together in really interesting ways. And every once in a while, I will buy my clients' yeah. books. You know, I'd be like, you know, I know that mm. this is yeah. something that yeah. will benefit you. I want you to give me the commitment to be reading, you know, 10 minutes a day or 10 pages a day or something like that. And then we have conversations in our coaching sessions about the concepts in the book. Um, you, you just can't think differently unless you're feeding yeah. your mind with different perspectives, right? Like you are what you eat, yeah. but that doesn't apply yeah. to just food. It applies to information too. Mm, mm, I love that. Okay, so, so then I got to ask you, okay, what are the three best book, books right now that you'd recommend for small business owners? What are the three best books if you're a leader of a small uh, So Buy Back, Back Your Time is for me like a no-brainer. Uh, I talk to everybody about it. I'm kind of obsessed with it at the moment. So great book. Uh, and very practical. <laughs> yeah, uh, very practical. I do like it. It's good. Uh, there's one called yeah. Built to Sell, uh, which is also really good. Um, okay. It is uh, essentially about how to create a sellable business, not necessarily how to scale your business, but you know how to prepare it for sale. Um, yeah. How to make something that's worth something? How to make how to have your business yeah and and, have and value sell it to yeah. Else. So it that's talks about you know uh, due diligence. Yeah. Talks about yeah. um, what you should be offering your team once you leave, right? Because you're gonna have to break the news yeah. at some point. Uh, and yeah. then the third book I would say yeah. is um, How Successful People Lead by John C. Maxwell. It's actually a very little book. It's a part of a, a series of books uh, by him, um, and I think leadership is one of the best things that all business owners should learn and continuously learn um, because mm -hmm. their quality of leadership w impact every area of the organization. Uh, so if you lead, if you learn that one thing, you just become yeah. a better manager and a better leader and everybody on your team benefit as well. H have you ever read the book uh, Multipliers? Uh, I have not. No. Have you read that book? No. Oh, okay, I'll put you, it on I my list. Love it. Yeah, I think her, the writer, it's a group of it's a group of people that read it, wrote it. Um, I think Liz Liz Cheney. Okay. I want to say. Let me get it. Um, Multipliers by yeah Liz Wiseman and Greg McCown. Greg McCown wrote a few books within this topic. I think they market it kind of towards a bigger demographic, mm -hmm. like towards corporate leaders. Um, and they, they just did like years, 10 years of research on effective leadership cool. internationally across industries yep. at bigger scales and what the differentiating factor between effective leaders versus ineffective leaders or more so motivated wow. teams versus demotivated teams. Um, and so they, they went not just to the leaders, but also to the teams to figure out from a, like mathematically what contributed the most to, to having teams be most motivated That's really cool. to working really hard. Yeah, it sounds like uh, built to last. Yeah, I so it was, I like it because it was yeah. lots of data, lots of data. Yeah, yeah, super is very, very, very practical book, but it's also just like very, very data driven. They did like a decade of research, and they both wrote individual books about their sections of what they did in the research. But the group kind of joined together to do this this multipliers um, book news. I, I I enjoyed it. It was it was given out to I was working in corporate and it was given out to people in my corporate environment and I didn't have any people on my team. I didn't I like I I was I was a I was a project manager manager so I was siloed. I had people that were like assigned to me for projects but it was you know, I wasn't a manager of anybody. But it shaped a lot of my perspective of one how I wanted to be led. Like working in a corporate environment or I imagine a small business environment. Like I was able to notate, "Oh, okay, that person over there, the reason I don't like them <laughs> is because they <laughs> they do those bad things. And the reason I like these people over here is because they do those good things. And it was just helpful for me to like discern. Even as an employee, I, I found benefit. But I think uh, I'm using a lot of the, the resources from it nice. now that I have a team of like 10 people. So it's like it is beneficial just to just to feel like just like it, it shaped a lot of my perspective. So I feel like you, you would I feel like you would love it. Um, talk to me about. Uh, talk to me about. There's someone listening to this that's probably a GM. They're pro they're a manager or they're a worker in some retail uh, fashion, and they're 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 trying to figure out because they're probably working in retail and saying I'm not making enough money, 
or I think I have a better skill set for the things I'm doing. I'm very passionate. I really care about the stuff I'm doing. I really care about the people I help. I love that I work on this team, but because of my skill set, I don't know where to start or, or, or how I can systemize my skill set to maybe be able to help a different demographic. So I'm, I'm like almost like talk to you as if you were talking to yourself back, back in the, back in the, you know, the cell phone tech days. Um, if you knew what you knew now and you, you had built what you built now, how would you jumpstart that? And how would you identify like, Oh, I, I could consult on this or I could help this, this type of um, I think it's a part of it is understanding what value you bring to the current company that you have. Like everybody's got skills that they, that uh, their company pays them for. Right. Um, so I was mm -hmm. in, um, I was doing like a job out of school and I was, uh, recruiting people for very like technical government jobs. Uh, for one reason or another, yeah. it wasn't really working out. And the person who had hired me is like somebody from my family. So, uh, when I broke the news, I told them, Hey, like, I know, I don't think this is a fit. He was like, Hey, why don't we go for coffee? I, I want to tell you about something, uh, so that you can think about, um, you know, if, when you decide to go somewhere else, this is, this is how I want you to think about things. And he drew like three circles, you know, and he said, you should pick something that you love something that you're good at and something that society will pay for, right? Where the demand. And if you can find something in that sweet spot, that's what you should do. And that is where bliss is, right? You'll never feel like you're working. You'll always make money and you will be providing a service that is, you know, sorely needed. Um, so I would probably start there is really understand what you're good at versus what you love. They may not be the same things and you got to make sure that there is a market for it. So you really got to understand what problem are you trying to solve with these services, right? And specifically for me, I solve the training problem, right? Um, and the systems and the scalability problem, but specifically through training, because you need all of those things to train somebody well. Um, and because a lot of business owners think training is like, it's like babysitting, right? They don't want to do it. They don't do enough of it. And when they do do it, it's like, it's not effective, right? Um, so like that for me, that is the very specific yeah. problem. And I go and I talk to lots of business owners. So if anybody listening to this is trying to figure out if this is a, an issue, um, that they want to tackle before coming up with, you know, the, the product or the service, come up with the offer and like send it to people, you know, Hey, uh, this is what I'm really good at. This is what I would mm -hmm. want to offer you. I'm even willing to do it for free, would you be interested and give me some feedback about, you know, what's interesting or not interesting about this for you. Um, so you really just got to get yourself out there. You got to be yeah. talking to people who you think you can help and ask them about what they value. Yep. And if, you know, what you offer is something yep. that they need, then, then that's it. Like it's a match, right? So, yeah, I love that. Well, yeah. And I want to almost want to hone in on that. Cause I think like, if I've learned anything is yeah. that you can sell almost anything. There's almost any service you can provide that someone mm -hmm. in this world will value. It could be that they're not in your circle. It could be that they're not in your contact list yet, but um, there's a good chance that like, I, I, I've seen it all the way down from like uh, seamstress, you know, like, so, like there's someone that might really value that. There's someone that might be like, yeah, that's exactly what I need. And as long as you negotiate to the right price point, it's about my needs getting taken care of. I was talking to someone earlier today about, um, using Zapier integrations and automations. And I was like, I, I, I can do it. I'd love to help you. And I'd love to be helped. Everybody needs assistance on that. And if you can solve that problem for me, just because you have an awareness of it, um, that's, it's a no brainer in my mind of, I will absolutely pay you a one-time fee. And if I care about it enough, I would pay you a retainer fee. Um, I, I'm surprised. Cause I think like I interacted with so many people in the corporate space who, you, I mean, functionally, you're creating reports, you're running reports, you're maintaining reports, um, or like that's in the IT side or the financial side, but like to some extent, there's yes. a service that's being provided. And it might be in Excel, it might be in SQL, it might be on a proprietary system, but there's principles that are in play there 
that are probably duplicative across other companies or across other industries. Um, and what's, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to me that like, I'm just taking like my, my, my experience, the analyst function. You know, I was, I was a financial analyst for, uh, investment analyst for, for four years. Like a lot of what I did was repetitive. And if I, if I had interacted with someone like you back then, I would be like, oh, if I just get really good at creating these things mm -hmm. and training these things, I could get, I could consult for yeah. a number of companies just by offering that as, as something to happen. Do you think that like, is that a side hustle that you recommend to people? Or is that, is it like if, if your friends, do your friends come up to you and be like, how do you do what you do? How do you get your clients that you get? How do you train the way you train? Are you like, you get like, like how many times does that happen where you're like, yeah, you guys could do this too. That I, I train people and I have expert, <laughs> I've, I'm an expert at what I train on and how I train and doing this process and help people with this. But like, you're also really good at this. You should just like help people do that. How, All how the time. Often I was literally just with? having a uh, dinner with somebody yesterday who is about or thinking about leaving their corporate job. They want to get into real estate. And we're thinking, uh, we're talking about what it is that he wants to do um, and how how he wants to do that. So we're talking through different strategies, things like that. And I think what what came out of it is, you know, everybody has something to offer, right? And just because you're not like a business person, you know, or entrepreneurial, that doesn't mean you can't be. You just have to do the things that yeah. entrepreneurial people do. And yeah. then you're an entrepreneurial person. Your results just haven't matched. Like they just haven't yeah. caught up to your mindset yet. Right. So it, it, it does yeah. take a little bit of time and patience. And, but you need to be able to kind of pitch your services pretty well. Um, because, I mean, his company yeah. is paying him for the services that he provides, right? Like he is an employee, but technically he offers services. They give him money. There's an exchange of value there, right? And the value that they get yeah. is lower or is higher yep. than the price that they pay him. Otherwise, they wouldn't hire him, right? So yeah. you can literally just take that yeah. value equation yeah. and you can apply it to something else. And if you can pitch it right, you have a business, uh, you know, at a, at its very basic level, of course. Yeah. Well, and and even if you think about, like, yeah, I love that so much in the <laughs> breaking down of that. I hope that opens someone's eyes to the possibility. Like, I can almost guarantee you, there's someone on your contact list that if you went to them and said, "Hey, I can help you for free or cheap," right? If it's your first person you're looking for a case study, I can almost guarantee you there's someone on your contact list that would be benefited from your help. But we just get t caught up in this like, I work for this company and I do this. And there's just like, I, there's no capacity to branch out beyond that. And it's because most people don't, like lack vision that that's even an opportunity. Like they would rather, if they are discontent in their role and discontent in their team, love maybe what they do, but they would rather go to another company and do something completely different because they think that's the problem versus being like, you know what, actually I can do this and I've learned this and I went to this company and they taught me this. I got invested in him for two years and I owned this function and I dominated it. I was awesome with it. And if I go to my contact list, I can see, okay, there's one, two, there's three people here that have businesses that this could actually apply to. And even if I just do a one-time fee and just ask for sure. a testimonial, right? Like you could absolutely can get started that way. And that's literally all it takes. It's all it takes is like, it's not a new side hustle. It's not a new business. It's not something that like you can do what you already know. Yeah. If you work in a corporate environment, or if you work as a teacher, or if you work in any any specialty, do what you already know and yeah. find someone else that needs that thing. That's what <laughs> yeah, and you got to keep trying, right? <laughs> Definitely, you got to keep trying. One of the things that stood up from yeah. the conversation yesterday yeah. was he said, yeah, but I'm afraid I'm going to fail. And I was like, okay, that's a really interesting thing mm. that you say there because you're defining failure by trying one time and then not succeeding therefore you're also defining success by succeeding your first time right and i was like oh, do you yeah. expect to oh yeah do you expect to succeed the first time that you ask anyone of anything yep. like probably not so the way that you define failure is also <laughs> the way that you define success so if you look at it that way obviously like you can only fail if you stop trying right <laughs> so yeah yep 
I love it. Well, it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm the only person I know where yeah. the first person I dated, I married. I'm the only person I know. That was like, it's so like, to be honest, and like, if you think about, like, I don't know, like, baseball may not be a huge thing in Canada. For baseball here, though, it's like, if you hit three out of ten baseballs, yeah. for every ten baseballs, you hit three of them, right? Every ten at-bats, you get three hits. Yeah. You are a Hall of Fame baseball player. You're one of the best of all time baseball players. And so we think about this, and then we apply it to business or entrepreneurship, and it's like, uh, my, my first business failed. That means I'm not meant to do this. And it's like, nope, that's actually mathematically incorrect. 90% of businesses that yeah. get started fail in their first year. That's just what happens. And then that other, that, the next year, another 90% fails. And the next year, another, like the amount of businesses that succeed long-term on that scale yeah. are just very small. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but like the fear, I love that the fear of failure is really just a fear of trying. Yeah. It's a fear of like putting yourself out there and committing to something. And I was, I was thinking that I was thinking today, like, I know I'm, I'm guessing you're probably pro college. Not every entrepreneur is pro, pro college. college. I am pro college as well. Like I think most people uh, going to university, I think is a good thing for most people, depending on what you're go, going for. Uh, I, I would hope you, if you're going for to be an engineer exactly. or a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, you're going to be great. If you're going for a science, scientist, if you're going for a liberal arts degree, maybe we should start talking. If you're going for, for something else, maybe even a business degree, we should, maybe, like, maybe you could, there's an argument to be made. But uh, I also was just thinking like, if you start a business and fail, it'll probably be less expensive and you'd probably learn more than getting a four-year business degree from a 100%. university. I never had a business degree. I actually uh, learned psychology and chemistry in university. Uh, and I thought about, I was like, yeah. maybe I, I could go back to school and learn <laughs> business or I could just keep doing business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I think I heard someone, I think was it like Alex Ramosi, I'm not sure who it was, but he was like, I could either go to Harvard for business yeah, or I could like exactly. open a gym. And so you just open a gym and now so it's just like, that's the perspective is like, do you want to be taught by someone who learns about it or do you want to be taught by someone that does it? And I think like, if you're going to invest in something that I would invest in relationships, communities, or coaches. If you're going to invest in something like that, I think everybody on some level needs to have one of those three things, and it's worth spending money on one of those th things as long as you take advantage of it and it opens the doors. You can absolutely buy courses that are not helpful. There's absolutely coaching communities that are not great. There's absolutely coaches that are scammers or people that are negative. But if you find a community that's solid, not only will it potentially lead to clients, it also probably just going to be like a ton of knowledge share and value that you can figure out, oh, my offer is like really weak and I can position it this way and it would be a lot more valuable. Or I'm thinking of a six-figure mindset. I'm thinking, how can I make $100,000? And I'm talking to this person and they're saying, how can I make $2.5 million this year? And it's just like, oh, whoa, my perspective is so, so drastically different than people that are at different levels and I wouldn't know that if I wasn't exposed to them. So... Um, I love that. I, I, I think that a lot of people listening to this, like consider that thought because I wish more people, I don't, entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. Risk isn't for everybody, but I, I wish that more people assessed their value and realized that they have something more to offer and that more people want it and more people need it. And the, the, the only thing really keeping them from doing it is themselves. Um, and that's just speaking to the people that like, there's a lot of listeners of this. Maybe you were in use of shoes and you were a entrepreneur. I like to say entrepreneur because it's like you, you, you look at all the entrepreneurs and you're like, oh, it's awesome and it's really cool. I just don't want to do the risk. Or like, I'm really scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to just jump. Like if you do something and fail, it'll work better because then as long as you commit to continually trying and doing something else, like I guarantee you, if you have nine failed businesses by the 10th business, you should be pretty fine. I'd be very surprised yeah. if that 10th business failed. Be super surprised. There's just no way you can bat that many times and go over 10. If you do go over 10, work for somebody else, don't do it. But it's just, I, I, you, I, I'm, I'm passionate about like people knowing that. So there's someone listening listen to this, following use of steps. There's, there's people that are great corporate, <laughs> great people in retail, great people in corporate, and they need to take action the way that you took, ac took action. Uh, can you talk to me about, Yeah. you were assessing that risk, right? And part of it, I'm sure, was the fact that you had the stability. Part of it, for sure, was the fact that the company, you, got your, you sold shares, you had financial stability, right. you weren't coming from a place of, I really need money. 
Do you think that was a huge contributing factor to you being willing to take that jump? So I started another company at the same time that I started consulting. Uh, and I took all of that money and I invested it into yeah. uh, that. So I didn't actually have a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, interestingly enough, so I was an employee of that company, aside from just being the founder. Um, and I did that for yeah. uh, about two years until three months ago when I went consulting full time. And uh, okay. when I left the company, I had to forego my salary. And um, that was really, really difficult because there was a sense of like maybe insecurity or instability there. Uh, my wife and I are also expecting our first child. Yeah. Um, so like pressure was on. Thank oh, you. Nice. Um, awesome. Congratulations. But like pressure was on, but yes, I, I, I just imagine. tend to take on some like really big challenges uh, with no experience. And I just kind of jump into it head first. Yeah. So I actually use that as motivation <laughs> um, rather than a reason not to do it. I just went all in. Yeah. I burned all bridges behind me. And I was like, this has to work. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to do what it takes to make it work. You know what I mean? Love. And, um, yeah. you know, at the yeah. same time, like I signed up for uh, a marathon and I was telling people in the group, you may have remembered that I, that I did that. And people will ask me, like, you're so crazy. Like, why would you even do that? A, I needed a physical challenge to kind of keep me busy, keep me disciplined. Uh, but another thing is that I realized about this is because I don't have any long distance running experience, I realized that really big goals make you level up. You know, when something is big, it's outside of your comfort zone and it yeah. kind of like shakes you yeah. on the inside. That's not, this is not for everybody, yep. but for me, at least when I have yep. something that's so big that like, there's just no room to mess around, I level up, you know? So I started reading about running and yeah. buying shoes and gear and like talking to everybody that I know. And I just went all in and it, I did the same thing for consulting. I just tried to get my hands yeah. on as much information as possible and talking to as many people as I can and just like trying to figure out like what my formula is. And, uh, you know, I think the coaching yeah. was a game changer for me. Because it not only gave me the confidence that I needed, mm. the community, I mean, like, that's how we got to know each other, right? Um, but it also yeah. um, it, it gives you the perspective. And, you know, like, I, I really feel like Dan is in my corner, you know, like a coach does like three things for you, right? Mm. They show you your blind spots, teach you better. They support you like they I feel like my coaches are on my team. You know, they're there to support me, right? Um, mm. And they, and they like, they cheer you on and they hold you accountable. Um, those, those are the three biggest things that mm. a, a coach will do. So would I, I mean, would things be different if I didn't get into the coaching program? Like probably it would take me a little bit longer to learn what I learned or get the results that I got. Yeah. But yep. you need to really invest in yourself. You need to go all in. Uh, if you're going to do this, like there's, there's no, yeah, you can't be half foot in yeah. half foot out. Like you can't, can't do that. Yeah. I love that. Well, let me end with this. Cause that's such a good point. And I, I want to close with this. Cause I think someone can listen to that and they might say, well, Grant, you if I, I don't have money to invest in a coaching program, that's fine. Coaching actually isn't for everybody. It's, it is for me. I'll, I have spent 20 to 25,000 the last year on coaching. I'll probably in my, in the next year, spend somewhere in the range of you know fifty thousand dollars just for that education as my business upgrades so does my knowledge so does my access to people so does the things i want to do like i'm just going to continually level up i can see myself spending something in that range for the next years of my life but if you're getting started you don't have to do that you don't you can find community online you can find community of like-minded people you can find friends and say hey let's hold each other accountable let's let's create let's let's read this book together a book is twenty dollars or an audible book is less if you have a subscription. You like, you can get a book. Yusuf's mentioned a few books for, for business leadership. If you're looking for something just tactically to like get started, you can even just do like, I don't know, maybe uh, like what, what's what, what's an entrepreneurial book that you'd recommend? Um, like the E Myth is a very popular one. E Myth, yep, that's it's an it's a really old it's an older book, 
I think it was written in the 90s, correct, but something to that extent where uh, it helps you identify whether you're a technician, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an operator. Um, oh, another book is Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits is a great practical book that fits for anybody, even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur. It just helps you be like, okay, let me do a self-assessment of is what I'm doing balanced and healthy? Is it aligned with my values? How do I stack the things that are important to me and do them on a consistent basis? So like you can start there and get someone to just read that book with you and say, okay, based on this, we're now going to have these new goals that we're going to hold each other accountable to. You can start to that point. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to me, and I'm sure you could reach out to Yusuf and, and join online communities of people that talk about this stuff and say, hey, I need motivation to do this. Where do I get started? I can connect you to those people. Yusuf can connect you to those people. You can, you can join, and I'm sure there's, there's places where we can direct you or places that we've been. And if you want to spend money, you can. I think you level up to that point, and you take risks one step at a time. That's the whole point is you have to take a step. If you read a book, that's a step. Then you better take the next step, which is reaching out to somebody. Then you better take the next step, which is holding each other accountable. Then you better take the next step, which is actually leveling up and taking a little bit more risk. It's not all at once, but it is a step of faith that you have to take no matter what. And uh, Yusuf, I'm proud of you because I think you're living out exactly what you're communicating. And I see it, the way, the way your business has grown and the way you've established yourself, I see it as evidenced over the years. And I think a lot of people probably can relate to you. And I think a lot of people, my hope is that they've learned from you today. So thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, where can people find you? Where can people support you? Um, so you can find me on social media. So I have LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, you can just, you, you know, search Yusuf Botros. Uh, the LinkedIn, or sorry, the Instagram handle is uh, my full name, Yusuf Botros with an underscore at the end. Uh, or you can go to my website, grndconsulting.ca. Awesome. Awesome. Dude, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I'm sure we'll talk in awesome. the future, but um, definitely check him out, follow him and follow his journey. And, uh, and yeah, thanks so much for spending time with me today. Share it with one person. That's all I ask. If, you, if you've gotten value from this, share it with one person, and I, I hope to talk awesome. to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Can't slow us down.